is uh, deemed meaningless or non-existent. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the idea of integration is also learning how to, uh, to put words or put language or to express the ineffable. So a lot of meaning attribution to it. And it's when a person seeks uh, support for their psychedelic work, it is important that they, um, they approach someone who, um, not just friendly to psychedelics, but in my opinion also experience themselves because it is only in that way that they might begin to have a shred of understanding of uh, what this person has seen. Uh, to conclude, so here is an outline of the types of integration support that psychedelic users slash clients are seeking. This is the framework that I employ with my clients as an integration coach. So I did study here. I studied, um, I had a ma my master's in psychology, but I'm not a licensed uh, MFT. Um, so often times, some, some of my clients, uh, while the time that I was working with them, they were seeing a therapist as well. And I also work with Ben um, as a team, and Ben assists with, uh, with the whole incredible science knowledge about pharmaceutical consultations, uh, and sometimes in tandem with a client psychiatrist as well. So a team of both a clinician and a coach who both specialize in integration is an optimal container for integration support. And I've listed all of this just to show, from at least from my field work within the community and with one-on-one -on -one coaching clients that I have, that integration is not just about talking about the experience. There is so much more to it. It's, um, it's a philosophy, it's a way of life, really. So to summarize, um, no need to say anything else, really, I don't think. Except for this one, my favorite slide of all, that integration is recreation. Recreation. And what would the world look like if everyone had these experiences? Thank you. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, second, I'm wondering about whether the path of an MFT is compatible with this kind of integration work, or if your choice to be a coach was partially related to the regulation. That's a great question that a lot of people are currently asking. Uh, I, I made the decision to not get licensed uh, after uh, a tumultuous couple of years where I really did, I, I really was um, uh, set on getting licensed until I realized that having that piece of paper is not as important as uh, the ability to have freedom in my work that I can do now with clients that I would not have been able to do before with a license. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. My question was um, pertaining to some of the plant medicines you referred to that had a kind of a very big cultural context in some cultures. How do you, how do you go about you know, respecting the cultures and not culturally appropriating these stuff and these medicines and kind of respecting that because I see said in Hollywood there's a lot of you know different people who are mm -hmm. not adequately qualified to do that. So how do you do that and be respectful to the culture? And this is you know a question that a lot of people are currently asking. So along with the Dixie Cups and the Hollywood parties, there are still luckily and thankfully a lot of people that are um, paying a lot of respect to the work. They work both in the Amazon and they work here in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, a lot of uh, psychedelic salons are curated on the topic. Uh, if you look on Facebook, there are a few communities here in Los Angeles that talk particularly about this topic. One of them is Aware Project. Um, I recommend to attendees. Um, and one way is that they gather in other conventions across the world. For example, we have, uh, I think in Spain coming up, it's called the, the Ayahuasca World Convention, where they bring in elders 
from and tribe representatives from the Amazon who work in conjunction with them. They stay in dialogue with them. They ask them exactly um, what are your needs, how can we support you, how can we respect the land. A lot of people are creating sanctuaries for medicine, mm -hmm. as far as I know, um, because right now the Amazon is pretty much being torched, unfortunately. So there are some people who create sanctuaries for ayahuasca vines and other uh, uh, master plants. Anything else? I know of a few people that have, like, for example, gone to the Amazon and experienced ayahuasca and, you know, loved it so much that they've kind of, like, um, teamed up with in, in indigenous people to bring their artwork to the United States, mm -hmm. sell their artwork, yeah. give, give them an income stream, mm -hmm. you know, directly related to their experiences as, as a way of kind of tying it back. Mm -hmm. In other ways, ayahuasca is just completely out of I mean, there's Kentucky ayahuasca on that. Right. So, it's, it's pretty wild at this point. Thank um, you. You didn't speak to the use of ketamine. Um, is there some resource that I could go to for that? Or? Oh, for what kind of resource are you um, hoping to Assisted find? psychotherapy. Yeah, so um, MAPS has some, some pretty good resources. There's uh, one book, I believe it's called The Ketamine Papers, uh, written by a, a few uh, psychiatrists that are pretty well versed in that. Um, another uh, psychotherapist that has done work with MAPS in both MDMA trials and does ketamine-assisted psychotherapy would be a man named Phil Wolfson. Um, and he would probably be I don't know if you talk to him personally, but like like his work is a lot, like he, he's a, he's a, a large pioneer in ketamine assisted psychotherapy. Because ketamine's approved, but um, not every provider of ketamine sees the same utility in the kind of altered state that it, that it produces. So that there's there's some that are giving ketamine, monitoring at a distance, letting you take an Uber home, and then you know right. tell me how it went a few days later. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas there's others that are employing a much more, um, you, you know, they're borrowing from the MDMA or psilocybin mm -hmm. style and applying it to, to ketamine. And, you know, I guess it works without that because that's the way they studied it. But personally, I think that it's just safer and people get more out of it when they do it in that kind of framework. Thank you. Hi. Um, I So I'm sober. I'm through 12 step and uh, I've always felt a little conflicted with this realm of things and it, the conflict comes from on, on one hand it seems so aligned with the principles of 12 step in terms of like you had the slide about what what the goals are and it, it read exactly why I got sober mm -hmm. and but then on the other hand it is a mind altering substance of which I have been addicted to in the past which I can't you know, it's, it, there was a question just after the break about the dopamine, and you know that's where my concern for me personally, because my addictions have always centered around dopamine producing or do dopamine activating drugs and processes. But even if it's serotonin based, there is still that sort of um, you know uh, hesitation that it, it could still become unmanageable for me and others. And I just wanted to kind of know what your thoughts are about it because it must have come up and it's fascinating that there are studies that are looking at addiction too but I don't know what you both think about if those two